Private Charles Smeltz of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, was a technician working on gliders in England. He worked long hours preparing each glider for the coming invasion. One evening, after dinner, a tired Smeltz laid down for a quick cat nap. An hour later, the glider was towed into the air. When Smeltz woke up, he was crash landing in Normandy. He had inadvertently become part of the greatest military invasion in history. The D-Day invasion began in the pre-dawn hours of June 6, with around 13,100 American paratroopers of the 82nd and 101st Airborne Divisions, making night parachute drops early on D-Day. Some 46% of the 82nd would be killed, wounded, or go missing. American paratroopers suffered high casualties, especially at Utah Beach, where many drowned under 70 pounds of equipment and the weight of their parachutes in marshlands purposely flooded by the Germans. Others were shot directly out of the sky by Nazi snipers, while yet others were shot while hanging from telephone wires or trees. At one French town, St. Mary Elise, one paratrooper was famously caught by a church steeple and hung helplessly there for hours, pretending to be dead so he wouldn't be shot. Some units landed as far off as 14 to 20 miles away, while some dropped into the ocean and drowned. Others were even accidentally dropped onto Utah Beach, not an ideal location in the middle of an invasion. Most of the paratroopers were green troops, and when they landed, they were confused and exhausted and couldn't even find their officers to direct them because the officers and sergeants had all blacked out their rank insignias in case of capture. As the historian Stephen Ambrose noted, many of these men shaved their heads or had fearsome mohawks cut in preparation for the jump and were delighted to hear that the Germans had been trying to shock the French civilians by telling them that the Allied invasion force would be led by American paratroopers, all of them convicted felons and psychopaths, easily recognized by the fact that they shave their heads. The men referred to the jump as the $10,000 jump since they were all given $10,000 GI life insurance policies by the Army. Private Ken Russell just made it onto one of the C-47 planes that would transport troops to the drop zone behind enemy lines. You see, Russell had a fever on June 4th, and he had to beg his way out of the hospital to be allowed to rejoin his company for the drop. Only when he was on the plane heading for Normandy did the 18-year-old remember that his high school class back in Tennessee would be graduating that very night. As I mentioned earlier, many parachutists landed in trees. One such soldier was Private Penrose Shear, who was shot by Germans while hanging defenseless in a tree. Private John Blanchard also got caught in a tree. And not wanting the same fate as Shearer, quickly pulled out his knife to cut the cord so he could fall to the ground. In his haste, fear, and adrenaline, he cut off all his fingers, something he did not even realize until later in the day. Private Porcella was lucky enough to miss the nearby tree, but unfortunately landed in the middle of a river, and immediately he found himself in over his head. In a panic, he called out, God, please don't let me drown. He was able to push his head above water, but his chute and the landmine and other acronyms he carried were all pulling him under the water. Then he remembered his knife, and he began to cut at his chute cords, but nothing happened. In a panic, he pushed himself above the water, and he said a Hail Mary. Suddenly, he realized why the knife wasn't cutting. He had it backwards. Freed from his chute and other items, he moved to shallower water, only to realize he was being fired at. It got worse. An AC-47 had taken a direct hit. Porcello recalled years later, all the training I had received had not prepared me for this. Meanwhile, paratroopers fighting for the critical bridge at La Fierre found themselves down to 14 men, low on ammunition, and holding on until reinforcements could arrive. Sergeant William Owens, believing he and his men had done all they could reasonably do, requested orders on what to do now. His commanding officer replied, I don't know a better place than this to die. Their courage made it possible to eventually take the bridge. If you're enjoying these stories, I wanna let you know that I've written a book. And this book deals with 10 different presidents and they provide advice for educators. Whether you're an administrator, a teacher, a homeschooler, this book's for you. It provides all kinds of advice and insights from some of our most famous presidents. And so I hope you'll check it out. Look at the description below and you can find it there.
Now, along with the paratroopers, there were about 3,937 glider troops who were also flown in to take strategic bridges and crossroads and hold them, often against German armor. The soldiers had a nickname for their gliders, flying coffins. Each glider carried 13 troops plus two pilots. General Westmoreland had this to say about the soldiers and the gliders and the glider pilots themselves. They were the only aviators during World War II who had no motors, no parachutes, and no second chances. Gliders often cracked and splintered upon landing. Spines were broken and men were impaled on the wood of the gliders. One of the glider troops, his name was Den Brotheridge. Most people are all too familiar with Captain America, a super soldier. Britain had such a soldier in the 26-year-old Den Brotheridge. With two years of training under his belt, Brother Ridge was ready for D-Day. He was described by others, and I quote, fair, conscientious, hard driving, quick to learn, a master at all weapons in the company, and an able teacher and an apt pupil, a natural leader. He was also affable and loved by officers and enlisted men alike. He was admired by everyone. He was also such a talented athlete that he was likely to play professional soccer when the war was over. He was among the best men Britain produced and worthy of leading the first soldiers into combat. He was also one of the few married men in the outfit and had a wife who was eight months pregnant. So it was, Brotheridge steered his glider men to capture a critical bridge behind enemy lines in the opening moments of D-Day. With his Sten gun or machine gun firing, he led his men across the bridge, enduring withering enemy fire. And as he prepared to toss a grenade into an enemy machine gun crew, a bullet pierced his neck. The bridge was taken, but Brotheridge was dead. You see, there are no superheroes or Captain Americas in war, just men. Brotheridge became the first man killed on D-Day. Although Brotheridge wasn't a superhero, he was a hero nonetheless, reflecting the ancient biblical maxim found in John 15, 13, there is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. We hope you enjoyed this hidden tale of a history maker. If you did, please click here to subscribe. And you will probably want to watch this story about the only female casualty of the Battle of Gettysburg.